You know, I've recently had a, just a tremendous opportunity to talk with uh, Daniel with uh, the Financial Innovation Podcast, and it was it was uh, just a great uh, time that I had with, with Daniel. Some of the things we talked about is the changing role of the CFO in the financial department. Welcome to the Financial Innovations Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Villani. We're helping CFOs save money and time by investing in cutting edge technology. I'm really excited today to introduce Donnie Bradshaw. Donnie, it's great to have you on the show. Daniel, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, and it's always interesting and great to have CFOs come on the show because, you know, they come from a lot of different backgrounds and, you know, it's um, funny to see that, you um, you know, just kind of how the roles evolved over the years where, you know, I've spent the past 14 years implementing technology solutions for CFOs. And, you know, 10 years ago, if I talked to a a CFO and mentioned the word data warehouse, I think they'd run away, right? And, um, you know, it's uh, funny to see some of the CFOs we've had on the show where, you know, you're able to speak a little bit more, you know, in terms of the technology language, communicate better with uh, with the IT staff. So, um, you know, maybe uh, if you just want to spend a minute or so just talking to us about, you know, kind of how that role has evolved, where, you know, where you see it going and, you know, we can go from there. So, Daniel, you make such a great point in technology and how much it's, it's, it's you changed everything, but particularly the, the, the uh, finance suite. Um, when, when I, now I'm aging myself a little bit, but when I started, at, especially in manufacturing, really the only ERP system such that it exists was you know IBM AS400 because that was the only thing that could handle bill material and routings. You know now, now if you look at the, just the myriad of different sources that are available, you know to, to the finance finance suite and, and you know the executive suite, you, you have. You know, there's 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 got to be probably hundreds of, of just FP and A systems now that that are all really really amazing and can serve a, a, a pretty small organization to a the most robust organization. So you know that I've just really seen how technology is driving that. And if you you think about finance too, you know, you start bottom funnel to, to the top of the, the CFO suite. There's a, a lot of the process is repetitive. You think about the, the AP and the billing process. So you, I think we're really going to continue to see, as we've already seen, that that how generative AI and intelligent automation starts to play into that. You know, being able to process a large amount of information in, in, in a short period of time, you know, and, and more efficiently. I think you know, we were talking earlier, Daniel, before, um, you, you know, the, the finance function, really, the, the, the first job of finance was to get the books closed and report accurate numbers. You know, where I'm seeing it's 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 now, that's pretty table stakes now, it's it's how well can you take the data at hand and, and a lot of data from a myriad of sources, not just internally more, but external, and how can you use that data? How can you aggregate it in a quick manner and make, make great business decisions with it? Not, not, but not just for your team, but for the organizational uh, as a whole, because the CFO now I think is, is seen much more as a, a, a partner with the CEO and, and not just as a, you know, we, we had the, 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 the old view of the CFO was kind of this this staid, dour person who, who um, you know, the Jerry's Down Fridays was he didn't wear a dress vest. <laughs> and now much more, much more involved uh, a, a partnership with the CEO. And it's driven, really driven around innovation, growth, uh, customer service, you know, things that they really maybe didn't used to identify as much with the financial uh, uh, aspect of it. But I, I see that much, much more much more prevalent now. Yeah. uh, And, you know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like, you know, with the emergence of cloud products, right, the role has shifted a lot from, you know, back in the on-prem days when, you know, you had to bring these tools into your, you know, into your own servers and data centers and stuff like that. IT played a a huge role where it was almost like finance didn't even want to, have many of those conversations until IT really vetted, looked at, you know, said, can we bring this in house? What's the, um, you know, expectation there? And now that, you know, we have the emergence of, you know, all these cloud products, it seems like, you know, finance has kind of stepped up a bit and said, you know what, you know, we can evaluate a lot of these tools, you know, we don't necessarily have to go through 
all these different processes. You know, IT still has to vet certain things like the security of it and, you know, uh, making sure that it works with our infrastructure. But, you know, it seems like around that point, you know, the finance role became a little bit more technical in that, you know, um, less likely to shy away from the conversation of what's in the data warehouse and how are you going to, you know, transform this data and bring it over? Um, you know, what, would you agree with that or have you seen something different? Absolutely. I mean, Daniel, you think about it, you know, the position of, of now, which is even even a, even a mid-sized organization will have it, you know, the, the FP&A uh, um, position, you know, the financial planning and, and analysis, it's a relatively new position. Um, you know, I'd say really, you really start to see them really prevalent in the last five to 10 years. Um, and before that position was really, it was, it was, it was absolutely an IT person. You know, that was always a, a, a an IT and finance uh, where they butt heads. Is if, if you needed to report finance, you had to go to IT to run it for you because they were, you had to go into tables. And, and, and again, everything was on a network. Um, so it wasn't cloud-based. So, you know, that, rightfully so, you know, IT would limit who had access to, to the, the data because they were inside the network. Um, but now it, it, things are cloud-based and you know, finance can go in and pull that data themselves. You know, data lakes that we, we, we mentioned earlier, you know, um, just a tremendous opportunity to take that data, put it in one place. And then you, any, you know, we constantly search for in, in finance now where, where those, where those like, where those large companies very, uh, it's a people-based business you know, versus manufacturing, which I did for a long time where you have raw materials. So, um, the, our employee ID number, we, we, that's one thing it, it passes through every part of the organization that you know, my employee ID number works in every system we've got, because sometimes that's your, your tangential point, you know, to pull data. And if you can start getting those tangential points, you can do just about anything with a data warehouse now. Um, and you, now, uh, what even 18 months ago, maybe I thought was, wow, five years from now, this is going to really be amazing. Um, you know, where you, you would, you would go in and in the old days we'd go in and you'd run a report for March. Um, you know, you go in and you select the month and the year and you go, okay, I need to see, uh, uh, actuals and prior year and you'd pick all these data sets and, you know, kind of build a pivot table. Now the role you, you see generative AI and you literally go in and say, Hey, how's my revenue in November compared to November of last year in budget? We're seeing this. It's providing those reports for you. And as you tweak the report, so, you know, machine learning kicks in and it, it's, it's learning what you want to see in the reports. Um, I saw a, a demonstration where a, um, uh, uh, it was a, a hotel chain that had, had invested heavily, um, in machine learning and, and they, they were getting information that they really didn't even realize they were asking. Um, you know, I can't remember how the question was phrased, but it was, a. Uh, they found out that every hotel where they had had spas, they had a higher returning, um, you know, higher, higher, higher customer turn rate. Um, they didn't even realize they were they were asking for that data. It came up as the, the generative AI was was you know, framing answers to their questions. That, that, that was absolutely unheard of you know, even 18 months ago. So it's amazing how fast that's happening. But but again, when you think about it, these things really, um, you know, they really delve well into the world of finance. That that's really what finance is: is taking data, um, applying an interpretive layer to the data, and then using use, using what you know about the organization to to act as an internal spot, you act as an internal consultant to your team. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's something where unless you have the luxury of being able to have thousands of analysts at your disposal that are all just looking for different data points and different things, you know, to go and say, hey, go and find me some connections in my data, you know, it's something where you can have, you know, these autonomous, uh, you know, agents going through and, you know, just constantly looking and seeing, you know, what, you know, what connections can I make and what can we learn? Um, you know, so it, it definitely gives a huge advantage to the companies that are investing in it, right? Because uh, now you can do more with less, a smaller company can, you know, be on the same, uh, you know, page, uh, you know, maybe even a little bit superior to the larger companies that aren't using it just because now you have, you know, an extra 
several hundred, several thousand, you know, invisible analysts just, you know, sifting through your data to, to see, you know, what can we learn? Yeah. You, you know, Daniel, you make a great point um, before, you know, and, and especially systems on um, finan- financial systems, because they were that they were very ERP systems traditionally were, were server based. So the, the larger the larger the organization, they had a huge advantage in data. I almost think that switch now. Now it seems you know maybe maybe mid-sized and smaller organizations that can be um, more reactive um, with their systems because now that there there's not that huge cost um, um, a prohibitive factor that we had in the past because it did have to be um, you know networked and you know it's got out of the box you know, system. So smaller organizations can really they have they can bring data in. Um, you know, a little bit easier than larger organizations can. Um, so the systems now make it easier to analyze that and, and make decisions with it. So, so that's almost reversed you know, um, thanks to technolog- the technological innovations we've seen lately. Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, there are a lot of companies now that are, you know, very hesitant to start looking at AI. You know, we don't understand it. Let's, you know, wait till it gets figured out a little bit more. We don't know, you know, kind of what the underlying data and what it's trained on that kind of stuff like what um i guess advice would you have for you know maybe those companies that you know they they hear i mean let's face it we hear you know chat gpt and all these big names of uh you know ai companies out there pretty much on the news almost every day if not every week um over there so you know anyone you know who doesn't know what AI is, has probably been living under a rock for uh, for two years. But, you know, for, for those who have heard of it and said, you know what, this is a little bit scary to me. I don't really know whether I should trust it. Is this a fad? Is this whatever? You know, what what advice would you have for those guys? But, but so I, I think that's the that's the struggle we all have with AI right now <laughs> is, is right is, is um, you know, you absolutely have to embrace technology, and I, I think you have to embrace uh, AI. Or you're going to be left behind. But the struggle we're, we, I think, it, we're all dealing with right now is, is um, you know, you 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 mentioned the key point is, um, as the the, the machine learning kicks in, you, at first we we've still always got the issue we'll always have that's been prevalent in systems since we had the first system garbage out. Um, you know, so AI is not going to help garbage out. What it can do, Daniel, to your point is you can, you can, you know, if you have more garbage data, it can lead you to make very, very wrong decisions. So I think that's one, one right way we, we're going to have to really be careful with AI is taking, um, you know, especially as the machines learn, uh, you know, and, and, and extrapolate what it thinks we're asking. And again, th- these are terms that we, that, that really we don't apply to a lot of machines, but you know, that's the terminology. So, but are, is the data we're getting accurate for the questions we're asking, or is it just merely kicking out bad data at, at, a, at a more conversational pitch? Because again, before you'd run a report and you go, that doesn't look right. But now because the AI is, is telling you something in a conversational tone, um, you know, are we more accepting of the results it gives us? Maybe, maybe to our detriment. So uh, uh, I think that's really something we're all kind of concerned with you know, is, is just because it's passed through an AI filter doesn't necessarily mean um, you're going to get more accurate data. Um, you know, it does mean you have access to more data, um, but it doesn't mean you have necessarily have more accurate data. So I, I think that's where we're all um, want to go. OK, let's let's we, we, we realize we have to be all in, um, you know, machine learning and AI. But we also want to be very careful that that's not we don't we don't uh, uh, get rid of every other system we got and check and balance and just go totally rely on AI. Um, so I think that's that's but but you know those are all ethical moral questions that we're all trying to answer. You know that that we're all going okay. Let's don't um let's go fast but not too fast. Right. Right. Yeah, and and you know it's uh it, it's great having you on the having you on the show because you you know you offer a lot of perspectives that you know especially some that are similar to to my own, you know, especially when it comes to AI, um, you know, and, and for for those watching, you know, we're going to put a link in the in the description over here. But um, we have a free AI readiness guide that, um, you know, where that you can, you know, go and download. But, 
you know, what I've even found just doing AI assessments for, you know, many companies is to your point is it's, it's the same fundamental stuff, right? Is your data clean? Is it accurate? Is it centralized where you can get to it? Right. Because if you don't have those types of things, you know, do you have data dictionaries and, and catalogs for everything? Like, you know, if you don't have the fundamentals right. It doesn't matter what you apply. You can call it AI, you can call it automation, you can call it, you know, whatever it is you want to call it. But, you know, the fundamentals that, you know, a lot of us have been pushing for a number of years are, you know, it, it's still the same thing. You, you put a different label on it and say now it's it's AI, but you still need to have data that's reliable that you can count on, whether a machine's looking at it or a human being's looking at it, it's still got to be right at, at the end of the day, right? Right. Uh, you know, Daniel, I, I remember when, uh, again, aging myself a little bit, when, the, when Windows first came out, um, you know, there was this huge, you, you, you'd see the pictures of people fighting each other in the stores, you know, to get uh, on their, their copy of Windows. You know. And then, and then I, I remember not, this wasn't a few, hundreds of people were buying this because they, oh, I must have Windows. They didn't even have a computer. They didn't have a PC. They, they, they didn't, you know, so it's almost like, a, you know, you almost see that with AI. Oh, I need AI. Well, AI is a tool. Um, I think it's a, it, it could, it's going to be an extremely valuable tool. And I think it can make smaller, mid-sized organizations compete for, with, 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 with that, you know, on, on tap with larger organizations and, it's got tremendous potential, but again, to your point, and it, it's you, you still it's still blocking and tackling. It's got to be good data. It's got to be clean data. You know, it's 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 it's. Um, I think it can absolutely automate, but it's but it can automate um, good practices. You know, you still got to have a good practice. You've got to have good data. You got to have controls. And so, um, you know, I, I think all those are still more relevant than they ever were um, because again you have so much data now so if you don't you know the, the likelihood of making a decision on bad data is even higher now because you have access to more data so i think you've got to really i think that it just you know you make a great point it, you really got to highlight that of having the, you know, the those good those good clean data points and and having the, the different data points and data sets data dictionaries you know it, again it's 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 that's not changed. That still has to be there. Just the, the amount of data we have and the way, the, the speed with which we can process has changed. Right, right. And, you know, kind of piggybacking off what you said about, you know, having good governance uh, processes, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to implement AI and have it become a black box, right? Where, you know, it's, uh, okay, the AI told me that this is important or that is important or, or whatever. And, you know, kind of what's paramount is making sure that there's always that traceability into how did the AI get to, you know, whatever result that it that it got to over there where, you know, I was involved in a, a project uh, for, for a big bank uh, several years back and, you know, they did a, um, they put in machine learning to figure out whether they should grant mortgages. And, you know, the AI made a connection that people from a certain zip code were more prevalent to default on their mortgages. And so it started denying, you know, all of their loan applications. And, you know, upon further investigation, it turned out the people living in that particular zip code were predominantly one race versus another. And, you know, they got in a lot of trouble for, uh, you know, uh, doing something that was in violation of the law. Right. So it's um, it's always important, you know, um, you know, and would love your thoughts on this as well. But just, you know, making sure that those governance processes are in place for making sure that, you know, a you're following every you know regulation, your AI is following every regulation. Um, you know, they don't know what it is that you're bound by, not bound by, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, you can't just say, hey, the AI did it um, and uh, get away with it. Right. So, Daniel, I, that that is the that is a perfect example to why why we say, you know, when people, you know, people go, well, are you really scared of AI? I'm not scared of AI. I'm scared of, of a false of a false a positive that AI can give you. Um, you know, if you start if it because, again, it can't be a black box where you just. You're, you're putting a question in the magic black box gives you an answer. Um, and again, you make such a great point on may, the least of your problems might be bad data. It might be you, you run into serious regulatory issues because you're relying on something that, that, that you, and you don't understand the tangential points and you've done something illegal and moral or unethical. So I think that's where, you know, um, a perfect example of where AI 
could and should scare us. You know, again, it's not AI really that scares us. It's bad decisions made you know, because because of again, you know, relying on a black box. Um, now, uh, I, I I had I remember another example I heard very recently. Uh, you know, system was using AI to you know people would send that. Now you see this everywhere, but they, they would send their invoices into a to a AP email. And the AI was taking them and, and processing the, the payables. Um, well, it the AI just did, you know, oh, this is how you process this customer last time. I'll process it this time. And they had this huge volume and they, they just assumed that, oh, it's processing all these correctly. Well, no, these just because it's from the same vendor and maybe was was, you know, has had the same item number didn't mean it should be. It was capitalizing things that should be expense, expensing things that should be capitalized, putting things to a wrong account. And so what they had is a system, they had a fully automated system that was absolutely processing incorrect data. Um, so, you know, that, but again, you got that black box of, okay, yeah, we've got AI, we're just going to take the outputs it gives us. And, and yeah, they're, they're sitting there closing books and they had a monumental mess. Um, so again, you know, that those are, those are areas where you've got to really be be careful with, with your data and make sure, you know, um, run it parallel. See, so see, so you process it and then check it and see, oh, uh, oh this is a, a potential issue we could, we should, we, we might have. Um, so yeah, I think you got that there. Those are perfect examples. You really have to be careful, um, you know, with, 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 with in any sort of, of automation of technology, you know? And it's funny because it just, always reminds me of, you know, it's kind of like the same problems that always existed, always, you know, still, um, you know, you still run into those kinds of issues with newer technology, right? Where, you know, back when, you know, all this web technology came out with usernames and passwords and stuff, you know, people got into trouble because the way that they checked passwords, you know, was open to, you know, uh, somebody just being able to, you know, inject some SQL code into a password. And, you know, the mistake they made was they just trusted that whoever's using it is going to use it properly in the way that it should be used. Um, you know, and now even, you know, going with AI, it's, you know, the, the scariness is not necessarily over the technology itself. It's where you should be, you know, a bit scared is do you have the right checks and balances and processes in place? to make sure that it's, you know, processing correctly. Like to your point of, you know, now having AI, you know, process, you know, AP, AR, that kind of stuff. Well, you know, taking a human out of the loop, is that going to cause uh, an issue where if I'm a vendor for a company and, you know, I no longer have a contract with that company and I just submit an invoice because I know what the process is and all the robot does is, you know, read, uh, you know, what the invoice amount is and, you know, run through the process and classify it and then pay me. Well, I didn't do any work and I sent an invoice and I just got paid, right? So, you know, making sure that, you know, I, I think there's a lot of fear around, is AI going to replace my job and get rid of, you know, this function instead of the like, how do we ensure that, you know, eventually, you know, 10 years from now, a lot of functions are not going to be done by hand anymore. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to be done, you know, by, uh, by AI, but how do we ensure that, you know, there is someone or a team or whatever it is that's in the loop to make sure that, um, you know, everything that's running is running properly instead of, you know, we're just kind of trusting that the AI is going to do it right and nobody's, you know, watching that. Yep. And Daniel, another thing that um, I've thought about and, and I've seen and you, you start to hear about it more and more is dynamic pricing um, and AI using dynamic pricing. Um, and I, I, I heard an example the other day. I said, you know, again, back to your uh, regulatory moral and ethical dilemmas is, you know, Pricing, uh, uh, using automation for 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 optim to optimize pricing, it, it's not a bad idea at all. You know, you know, during you know, hotels do it, uh, uh, airlines do it, gas stations do it. Um, but again, it, it can't be a black box, and you've got to have checks because what if right right now you know there are storms coming through Florida? What if you rely totally on automation and you have a you have a you have a pricing model, pricing calculator that's set up with AI that 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 you haven't vetted, you don't have checkpoints. And it raises prices during during a time of disaster, which we all know that that's at best a, a immoral, but a bit is it's also illegal. You can't you can't gouge. So you know, again, an, uh, it's an example of you know just just and and you know do, do we want to do we really want to raise prices on certain food stuff 
food items you know, based on a based on a, a, a calculator because you know, that's that, that again we're getting toward feeding feeding families you know is do we really want to try to start milking margin there I, I don't I don't you know you could argue we're doing it everywhere else but you know I think these, these are dilemmas and, and and moral you know conundrums that, that we have and we should have you know um, so you know I think it's just something we've all got to so embrace technology but but, you know, as with anything, be, be guarded too. Um, you know, I think, you know, it, it's just always that thing we all should do is do the right thing. Um, you know, so again, uh, automation, if, if you're doing the right thing, automation should be a problem for you. It should help you do the right thing better. You know, so. Right. No, that's that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I guess just around technology in, in general, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you remember back when the iPhone first came out, they had the commercials of there's an app for that. There's an app for that. It seems like right now there's a, there's an app or SaaS platform or some kind of cloud utility for every single thing that you could possibly, you know, imagine, um, you know, and, you know, for those that, you know, may not be, you know, up on what all the latest everything is, um, you know, how, how do you filter through the noise of, you know, I'm sure you get flooded with vendors saying, oh, you need better dashboards, you need better analytics, you need this cool AI software I came up with, you need, you know, whatever the, the you know, the um, acronym of the day is uh, over there, you know, how do you kind of filter through the noise of what, you know, everyone else out there is kind of telling you, hey, you need to have this in order to be competitive and, you know, what you know, you actually should be looking at and uh, improving in terms of, you know, such, such a great question. I, I tell you what, I, the way I approach it is take technology and, and just push it to the side and go, what am I trying to accomplish? And then once you define that, you know, and it, it might be anything is let's go old school and go chart our process flow chart. What am I trying to get to? Um, you know, it's, if I, I'm trying to process AP more efficiently and quickly, then go and look at the technology available to do that. Um, and then, then you make intelligent decisions. You know, what's my price point? What platform do I want it to be? Maybe something as simple as an Excel platform or do I want to, do I want to stand alone? So you think then you start to look, you start to build your parameters around it. But I think if you start with, with take technology, don't now look, we've all been guilty. I guarantee you I've done it. You hear about this technology and you go, Oh my gosh, that's amazing. And so you buy the technology versus the solution. Figure out the solution you're trying to get to. What are you trying to accomplish? And then find the best technology fit um, that you know accomplishes that. And then I, I think you know I, I have we we have we re-implemented our entire tech stack, um, and it has gone tremendously well. You integrate. Uh, you used to. I, I always said I never had a, a good ERP implementation. There were just various levels of bad. Some were worse than others. You know, they're, they're because, you know, and a lot of them's because they, they, they're not, you know, they're, they're cloud based now. And, you know, it's almost like instead of having to implement one gigantic system, which is what you used to have to do, you, you can always take it off in smaller parts and do it. So it makes it a little bit more palatable. But, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's finding the right technology partner. You, know, you, you can have really great technology and we've all seen that you don't have a good partner to implement it well. And you don't, you don't end up with, you know, you might, might have something that's not as good as some other technology, but boy, you're, the implementation partner is great. Uh, and, you know, so I think that's also very, very important when you look at technology. Um, you know, one, one, our, tr our, our um, industry, one thing that we have a lot of volume and we have to process it quickly because whereas, you know, manufacturing, a company our size might have a hundred employees since we're people based, we're service based, you know, we have 500 employees. Um, and so, you know, something you don't think about credit card processing, um, you know, that was really so that that's an example where AI is so great because that was a job. And think about how long it, 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 it would hold up close, month in close. OK, we got to get the statement in, then they got to get it coded. And you're waiting for all the sales guys on the road and sales sales people to send their receipts in. And then, you know. You had one person almost that had to do just that because at first they had to get, get everything expensed you know, and, and coded to the right account. Then they had to do the awful part of taking all those receipts and matching it up. Um, now, they, they, and they, I, I, you know, I, I'll tell you, I don't mind. We, we're partnering with a company called Ramp, and there's a lot of different that they have been wonderful to work with. So, um, but but you know, that's where you you, you know, 
I go and use my card um, to buy, and we we have we 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 built. You know, there's four questions again, Daniel. To your point of, we 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 approach this one as what are we trying to get to? Well, we we needed. There were really four questions that we said that that it needs to answer. You know, is it billable to the client? You know, does it need to show up as a line item on the invoice? And we we had these different scenarios. So I go and use my card, and it, it's 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 immediately if I buy gas you know, or pay a toll. Um, okay, is this billable to the customer? No. Nope. Okay, then then what is it? It's toll. Great. It saves that receipt. It's automatically it processes the transaction to the expense account. Um, nobody has to touch it. Not me. The receipt then, if and an auditor can go check it eighteen months later, and that receipt is there from the transaction. Um, much more efficient. And even for us, if it's for a customer and it needs to be billed back, um, you know, I, I can guarantee you. Um, because it, it, it it's that we miss those before. How how can you catch everything that's billable back? Um, you know, maybe there was a time lag you know, when the receipt came in. Now you you it, you can't you 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 can't miss it because it's everything's going to come in and it must be. You, you have to answer the questions and you know, if it's billable, it's going to sit. And so we had it set up where it sits in a, a work in process file. So you, if you'd say it's billable, you got to have the project and job to bill it back to. You. So that's an area where, man, it's, it's, it's one of those that's worked better than maybe we thought it would. So, um, but it was a case to your point where we said, rather than going just buy, buy something and I will, I, that's where my, I have the um, best team in the world. And I, I pretty much turned that part over to them. And uh, you, you, when you take a, a lot of us ops, finance and, and project managers, and they are really going to get thorough. And, and they had a, just this a tremendous flow chart and decision matrix that they used. They found the perfect product and the perfect partner, and it just worked amazingly well. But but credit to them, what they did is they said, okay, here's what we're trying to do. And they found a product that fit what they were trying to do versus buying a product. I think that's a big differentiator I see when you're making decisions on, on what you're supposed to use. Yeah, that I mean, that's that's a fantastic point, you know, and, um, you know, for this is why, you know, we started the show, we wanted to give a lot of, you know, great tips and, and um, you know, recommendations to, you know, other CFOs, finance functions out there, you know, highly recommend, uh, you know, anyone watching, just, you know, make sure that you uh, subscribe to our channel and, you know, to get all these, uh, these great tips that that we're giving out. Uh, you know, but to your point, you know, there's, um, it, it's very easy to get lost in the, hey, let's buy this solution. It's going to solve a problem and, you know, put it in. And I feel like the problem has gotten a lot worse since the clouds come out because it's, oh, it's just 200 bucks a month per user or whatever, right? And, and so you pay 200 bucks a month per user for this solution and another 100 bucks a month for that solution and another 500 for the other solution before you know it you know, you're spending a million dollars a month, uh, you know, on, on all this technology, right? But, you know, there's that initial rationalization of, you know, what do we want to improve? And, you know, one of the, you know, biggest uh, inputs or drivers to that is what are we spending the most time on, right? And, you know, I can, uh, um, you know, resonate with your, um, your example there for the expenses, because, you know, doing, putting in my expenses and all that has always been, one of the biggest uh, annoyances where, you know, I won't do it right away. I'll wait till like the day before the end of the month. And then I've got a thousand receipts I've got to go through and scan and, you know, and, and yep. upload. And, and you can't and find, you can't find a receipt that, that you right. know, uh, uh, yeah. And it's just, oh man, it's just, yeah. We, we, you know, we, we all hate that. And, and then, right, you right. Know, finance at, at finance mechanic hates processing them, you know, and, and, right. and, and you know, HR hates having to follow up with it, you know. So, so they, they, again, that was that was almost like a hey, it's it, this is a problem. How do how do we use technology to solve it versus going and buy something? And, and you know, Daniel, another great point you just made is, um, uh, you know, terms we hear now that we didn't two three years ago. You know, um, analyzing your tech stack. How often do we hear that? You know, um, now is is you know going in and go okay. Let's take a look at all our technology subscriptions. Um, we we do it we do it now. We get we really probably do it twice a year. You know, um, it, it, we we did it the first time we did it. It was a uh, kind of kind of funny that that you know um, uh, we, we we had multiple subscriptions that were basically doing a lot of different project management tools. And then I found where 
two different offices were using the same project management tool, different versions. Um, so I was like, okay, let's at least I'll be on the same version, you know, <laughs> but yeah, you know, you get that where, where, and it, it, somebody looked at it and saw it and said, Ooh, we need that. Um, and, and, you know, so we, we have, we, we, we've tried to say, okay, let's, let's all, let's all look at this together and make sure, I, Hey, we want you to be innovative and, and we want you to push and, and, you know, but, but let's all make sure we're, we're, you know, we're not, we're not overlapping technology. And like, you know, Daniel, you can, the, the death by a thousand cuts is what we call it on, on technology subscriptions. You know, it's only $200. Then before you know it, you got, yeah, but look at all of these we got. Right. Right. It, and, and then, you know, I mean, I don't know if you've run into this situation, but you know, I, I see it more often than not, um, where you got the company that's got the enterprise, you know, Tableau license, and then and then the other department has the enterprise Power BI license, and you know, it's it's very similar technology where um, you know one group doesn't know what the other group bought, you know, and, and either you run into situations where multiple groups have enterprise licenses, and of course the the sales guy is not going to tell you, you know, don't give me more money over here and and buy uh, buy the product again. Um, you know, and you run into cases like that or two different technologies that are, you know, very similar that, you know, everyone's buying licenses for. So, you know, I think it's definitely great um, that you brought up about, you know, looking at those licenses because it's not just about, you know, hey, how much are we spending versus what are what's the budget for it? Um, it's all also about, you know, are we spending effectively and are we investing in the right stuff? And, you know, now do we have to have support staff for this product and that product and it's overlapping, but we need different people because we can't find, you know, someone with the same, uh, you know, with both skill sets uh, in there as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, we, we, we see it. And, and, you know, the, the, the Tableau example you, you get, I mean, I think that I bet probably every organization has had that where they go, Oh my goodness. You know, you had somebody, you, you know, well, it's, it's, okay, now, and you, boy, you're going to get some people go crazy about it, but, but, but it's, it's, Pretty much the same product. Now I know some of them are visually more appealing, but you know you're really doing the same. Same they can do the same. It's almost like it's almost like Teams and Zoom. You know, I mean, so there's a preference there, but really you're doing the same thing. So you know, um, so yeah, maybe, maybe it's worth picking one and 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 you know cut, cut that subscri subscription cost in half. You know, so. Um, and if it's and if there's a valid reason to have both of them, you know, there are many instances where, you know, maybe one product has certain features that certain groups need. It's just that more often than not, companies get themselves in trouble because they just don't know. They just don't know. They're approached by a vendor. Vendor says, hey, you need, you know, this product. They say, oh, wow, this is great. They buy the product. Somebody else is going through the same thing, you know, by a different vendor. And now, you know, two different vendors sold you, you know, a very similar product and, you just didn't know what was, you know, what was in there. Um, I remember the first time, you know, I heard, I, I heard the concept um, because, you know, you guys, you guys are our, our, our innovation podcast, you know, was an open API. And I thought, now, wow, that, but that'll never happen. You know, nobody's going to give an open I, API. You know, now everything, you better have an open API or nobody's going to buy it, you know. Um, but, but, you know, instead of, it, you know, it's, oh, well, you, you're you going to, you know, what we heard is oh, if you have an open API, you're going to have a few people dominate the market. The exact opposite has been true. An open API, it allowed much more entree into the market. And I, I think, you know, it's when you have more competition, things get better, you know. So, um, you know, and I think, I think you know, we, we joked earlier about, you know, I, I do think IBM did an amazing job with AS400 because they built something nobody else could do. But it was just them. You know, there, there, there wasn't there wasn't a big drive to innovate because what, why? It was just you know, it's just you, you know, um, but as we get more and more systems, you know, it, it does, it drives innovation, it drives performance, it drives, um, um, you know, preference. Um, so I think that th those are usually always good things for the market. Yeah. I, you know, we've, we've shifted from, it, it used to be, you know, if you rewind, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, someone was looking for what vendor had the most number of products, you know, if, Oracle or SAP or IBM, you know, had a, a CRM system and a planning system and an ERP. So oh, I'll just write one check and, you know, and, and get everything there. And, you know, it's all integrated and everything. And, you know, now with the cloud, you can kind of go best of breed where you say, what's actually the best system for, you know, my CRM? What's the best system for my ERP? Um, you know, it, it has its own set of challenges in terms of how you're going to integrate everything and, you know, get all the data from one place to, to another out there. 
but it at least enables you to, you know, how do I get all the features and benefits that I need without having to just kind of accept what you're given because you bought the bundle from, you know, this vendor or that vendor. And, and, and right, you know, so even five years ago, that's what, when you bought an ERP system, Daniel, it's, it's exactly what it was. Is who has the most features, you know, built and, 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 you know, you would see, see the different, you know, your Oracles and your Microsofts and they'd go and they, the, the, the Microsoft ERP, but, you know, they would go, they, oh, this works well with this. They buy them, you know, and, and okay. So we've got this. Now you've seen that, that very, very, that big migration is, is, um, when we, when we, uh, looked at systems this, this time, 18 months ago, um, it was the, this look at all, look at all the partners we have. And, you know, they'd be page after page of, of, of partners that, that, you know, already had an open, that already had a, you didn't need an open API or you had an integration written. And, and, but, but now you, now, now there's a partner for everything. So, you know, you gotta, now you gotta kinda, kinda, you know, do your homework on, okay, what, what partner do I need to, uh, you know, I mean, go to any major ERP system and go, okay, uh, uh, you know, customer resource management. They're going to have a hundred uh, and they're probably all really good. So it, it's all right. Which, which, which CRM do, do I, do I want, you know, and, and, you know, how, how far do you want to integrate into your system? So I think those are, you know, new challenges that come up, but again, uh, it, it is funny how much that's changed. It's okay. We want to, our ERP system can do it all to now. No, no, no ERP system can do it all, but look at all the partners we have. You know, between us and our partners, we can we can we can do anything you need. So, how do you balance the you know? Because I know one it, or you know potential issue that a lot of people run into is you know now you've bought from di five different vendors, you have a different CRM versus an ERP versus whatever. You know, in terms of the support behind it, how do you ensure that you know you kind of have the right team in place to be able to you know to manage? You know, do you go for a fractional kind of managed service type of thing? Do you you know do it in house? Like, how do you how do you make those kinds of decisions in terms of like the that is exactly what we did. We, we, we tried, we, we tried different models. Um, but we went with a fractional service, um, that, that, you know, it was a fractional service. They, they really almost became like our third party implementation partner. And, 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 you know, they were great about going, um, you know, we, we, some, some things we want to probably go too deep and they go, let, let's, you know, the cold crawl crawl, walk, run philosophy, you know, they were great about going, let's, let's get this, this, you know? And so we phased out the approaches with, with fractional partners. And that is where we really, really, really had the most benefit, um, was, was doing it just that way versus, um, it, not, not to say you can't get a great implementation from the provider, you know, uh, but really where we found the most bang for our buck was, was using that third party to kind of fine tune what we were trying to do with the system. And it, that's worked really, really well for us. Yeah, no, that that's great, you know, because it's it's always important to, you know, to have that right partner in there where, you know, if somebody's just telling you yes to everything that you want to do and it's you want to do this, yes, and, and that one, yes, and that one, yes, and oh, can we have this in six months? Yes, right, then then you know that, you know, there's, there's that difference between, you know, who's actually invested in you as the customer and, you know, want to make sure that, you know, you're set up the right way versus, you know, who's just trying to get the sale to, you know, to check the box to hit their quota for, you know, for, for whatever it is that, you know, for that, that period over there. I'll tell you another thing we started doing, Daniel, too, is every, every solution that we looked at when we got to the final two or three, you know, we didn't do it with, as we were evaluating, when we got final two or three, we said, we want to, we want to meet, we want to meet and talk to our solution architects, um, you know, to see, you know, what, 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 was there going to be a time zone problem? Was there going to be a communication problem? You know, what, did did they, uh, you know, did they understand what we were trying to do? Did they have experience in our market? Um, you know, so, you know, because again, a salesperson sometimes, um, a good one will tell you, oh yeah, we can do it. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, so, so you, you, you need to, you need to make sure. Um, so that was, that was another thing we did is we said, let, let us meet our solution architect. Let me, let us meet our implementation team. And honestly, I think pretty much in every case, that meeting, not price, but that meeting was what, what determined which ones we, we, we picked. Um, almost every single case was like that. 
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think a lot of companies, um, you know, can get lost in the, you know, hey, we'll just hire a big company because they've done this a million times to and and what you were looking for, it seems like is, you know, not just, you know, hey, does this company have the experience doing this, but are they going to put the people on this project that are going to have the experience and, you know, ability to do it? Are they going to treat this project like, you know, like it's they're doing it for their own company instead of, you know, for uh, for a customer out there, you know, and, uh, you know, I recently finished a, a project, uh, you know, several months back that, you know, a big company went in to do the implementation. They went in, it was a CPG company, and they're going and telling them that price volume mix is something that nobody should do. Nobody does it. And, uh, and it doesn't give you any valuable information. And it's like, wait a second, this is an industry standard for right, you know, yeah. this kind of company. And uh, you're over here saying nobody does it. Meanwhile, everybody, you know, out there does it. And, you know, it's a, a matter of, you know, does that company have experience in that market? Sure. Did they put the people on that project that have experience in that market? Uh, no. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. Uh, well, yeah, yes, we, we, we heard, we heard very similar things and, you know, you, you, you quickly learn that, okay, this is probably a great product and these are probably great implementation specialists, but they, they specialize in a certain market and, and, it, and it's not our market, you know, so, um, you know, and again, I think that just, these are things that, that help you, you know, make the right decision in the product. Um, and so, you know, you really invest in the product and the team, um. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I know we're uh, we're getting close to the to the end over here. You know, really appreciate um, you know you you coming on the show here, and you know, like I said before, just uh, highly you know recommend that you know those watching you know subscribe to the channel, um, you know, get all the the updates that that we have over here. Um, I guess before we wrap up, you know, any other you know tips or tricks or you know words of wisdom that that you have. Um, you know, just re either related to anything we talked about or maybe something we haven't covered? No, no. so I, I was going to say one thing, I, I, you know, since since we met, I've I, um, I gotten tremendous value from from um, um, subscribing to you guys. Um, it, the best way to find out about technology in the, in the sector you're in is talk to other people who are in that se sector and you, you'll quickly find what's worked for them, what hasn't. So um, I, I listen, I, I highly recommend, um, um, you know, subscribing to you guys, watch it, get that, get that good information, you know, that, that's, that's centric to, to, you know, finance and innovation. And, and, you know, it'll, it'll, every, every data point helps you make a better decision. So. Um, right. Right. Well, um, in terms of, um, you know, if, if those watching, you know, have questions, uh, comments, just want to get in, in touch with you. What's the best way um, for them to, to do that? Is it LinkedIn? Is it? Absolutely. Look, always happy to hear from anybody. And it's it's uh, uh, my email is, is still, I think, the best way. Um, and it's it's my email is Donnie, D-O-N-N-Y dot Bradshaw, B-R-A-D-S-H-A-W at purered.net. Pure like P-U-R-E and red the color dot net. Hab, more than happy to answer any questions or, or, or you know, anything I can do or, 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 you know, hey, better yet, you know, if you have something that you tried that might work, um, tell us about it. We'd love to come back on here and talk about it as a group again. So, um, yeah, no, that that's great. And, you know, we'll we'll include all the information in our uh, in the description to the video there. So that way those, uh, you know, can just copy paste, uh, you know, instead of typing out, typing everything out. But you know, it was, it was great, you know, having you on, Donnie, really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to do a follow up episode in the future, see, you know, what other uh, innovative uh, technologies, processes that, that you guys have, uh, have been have implementing. Absolutely. Daniel, I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it sincerely. All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys.